Hi, everyone. So thank you so much for joining us today for um, Hamilton Immigration Partnership Council's Newcomer Week. And this particular event is called How an Immigration Refugee Board Hearing Works. And so it's pretty self-explanatory in that title. Um, I know I personally am excited to see what it's all about. My name is Naomi Bula, and I'm um, delighted to be one of the board of directors members uh, volunteer for MICA House, which is um, a home that welcomes refugee claimants in Hamilton, Ontario. Um, Hamilton, of course, is the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. Um, I just want to respect that as well today. So thank you so much for joining us here. And um, I wanted to let you know a little bit about our agenda for our time together. So uh, right away, we're going to do this, just a little bit of introduction and background about who we are and why we're doing this. Um, then we're going to jump into a simulation. And just a reminder again, that will be recorded. We recommend turning your camera off if you don't want to be um, on screen. And um, then we'll take an intermission and have a little time for reflection. Um, and then we'll continue that simulation. Now at the end of that, we'll sort of do a little mini wrap up <laughs> so that we can end the recording. Then we really do wanna spend a bit of time in conversation and Q and A. Um, so just to give you a little bit of a sense of how the next hour will go. Um, and again, we're so glad that you're all here with us. So uh, the first person I want to introduce um, is the executive director of MICA House, Scott Jones. So Scott, we're so glad that you're here with us. And um, will you please introduce yourself and a little bit about your work? Absolutely, thanks Naomi. And good afternoon, everybody. Yeah, I'm the executive director of MICA House. And uh, I also wanna thank the Hamilton Immigration Partnership Council for doing Newcomer Week. That's fantastic. And there's a lot of great content this week. And uh, I'm really glad that you're joining us today for the simulation that we're gonna be providing. Uh, some of the things that I wanted to share with you that you may or may not be aware of that except for uncommon circumstances, all refugee claimants in Canada are going to be presenting their application for Canada's protection in person or in person by video at the Immigration and Refugee Board. So in this next hour, Mike House is providing you a simulation of the kind of interaction which could take place between a refugee claimant and a member of this board. Now, it's a really serious interview, and it's a pivotal moment in the life of a refugee claimant that will dictate their future, absolutely. Now, prior to the interview, each person making a claim is going to have prepared and submitted quite a bit of written material, including a retelling of their story with a detailed description of who they fear and why. Now, those of you who are local to Hamilton um, will know about Mike House or may know about Mike House, and Naomi has given some introductory remarks about that. Uh, for the sake of others, we provide short-term housing, we provide settlement assistance and networking for newly arrived refugee claimants. Now, in late 2019, we began a partnership with Matthew House Toronto in order to expand their well-established and excellent hearing simulation called the Refugee Hearing Program or RHP for short. And it has since become a major part of what we do here in Hamilton as well. So in other words, the simulation you're about to experience is also a regular program that we offer in support of this community. Friends, refugee claimants all across Ontario who are about to have their hearing can book a time with us, with the RHP, and we will personalize a two to three hour confidential simulation based upon their material that will prepare them emotionally and mentally for the kind of atmosphere and questions they could encounter. We're very careful, we're very cautious not to offer any legal advice that's simply not our role. Instead, we see ourselves as complementary to the hard work and time spent by excellent immigration lawyers province-wide. Uh, today, we are joined uh, by Mr. Tom Pinckney. Uh, Tom has been involved with the Refugee Hearing Program for quite some time uh, through the Toronto cohort that is well established. And he has also assisted with the province-wide province expansion uh, that Mike House is, is overseeing. And so it's a great pleasure to introduce Tom, who's a former member of Canada's Immigration and Refugee Board, as well as an educator and a superintendent of schools. So uh, Tom, I believe I'm going to be handing it over to you and um, I believe our simulation is shortly underway. 
Yes, sorry, I'm, I'll just jump in very quickly again, just to mention that again, this is, let me just make the disclaimer that this is a simulation. Uh, it's not based on a true story. Um, every claims process goes differently. And our two participants here uh, are acting. So we have Tom who is joining us and we're so grateful for his time. We also have an actor who will be playing Simon. And so we're very thankful. Um, that Andre is here to play that role today as well. Tom, please take it away. Thank you, Naomi. I'm speaking now to the claimant and I'm beginning the simulation. So, hello, uh, we're on the record, which means the proceedings are being recorded. My name is Tom Pinckney and I'm the person who will act as the adjudicator, sometimes called the member for the hearing today. In an actual hearing, I would be the person who would make the decision in your claim. This is a simulated hearing, but we want you to have an experience that will be close to what you can expect in an actual hearing. The simulated hearing is normally private, and the documents that I would have in my possession would be destroyed by me as soon as we finish the simulation. Now, I'm wondering, I'm not able to see the claimant. Can someone help me with that? Simon, Please. will you speak up? Can you see me? I could not now, I cannot, no. What's going on? There we are, now I can see you, thank you. There we are. Okay. okay, so you heard what I said and I was addressing those remarks primarily to you. Um, right. I gather that we are not using an interpreter today because this is the point in a, in a normal hearing where the interpreter would be sworn in, but I'm going to begin then by asking you, sir, to state your name for the record. Uh, my name is Simon Ogobe. Thank you. And would you spell your last name, please? O G O B A Y. Thank you. Now, we'll begin with an affirmation. Would you please raise your right hand? And would you, do you please solemnly affirm that the evidence you will give in this hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Thank you. This is the stage at which I will enter all the evidence into documents that I have that is in written form. The only written document that I have in front of me is your narrative, but uh, in our actual hearing, of course, there would be the rest of your basis of claim, which contains a lot of autobiographical information about yourself and your family. Uh, there would be other documents, including the national documentation package from the Immigration and Refugee Board, which provides uh, a description of the country conditions that relate to your claim and any other documents that you might have submitted in support of your claim, such as police reports or hospitalization reports or things of that sort, possibly affidavits and so on. Now, sir, you're claiming to be a convention refugee or a person in need of protection. A convention refugee is a person who um, has a well-founded fear of persecution in their home country. It can be based upon uh, their race, nationality, religion, political opinion, or by uh, their being a member of a particular social group. Uh, from reading your narrative, I believe your claim is based upon your political opinion. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. In making a decision about your claim, I have to consider several issues. Uh, the first is identity. I need to be confident that you are who you say you are by the time the hearing ends and uh, that your identity related to the political aspects of your claim is as you say it is. Secondly, credibility. Uh, credibility is a, an issue in every refugee hearing. This means that I have to believe that you have a genuine personal or subjective fear of returning to your home country. Further, thirdly, I will compare that fear to the, what I know about the conditions in your home country. Um, because your fear must be objectively well-founded in order to provide a basis to support your claim. Um, in some other claims, I would also consider such issues as internal flight alternative, which means uh, as a reference to whether uh, you could possibly go somewhere else in your home country and live a successful uh, life. Um, 
and sometimes the issue of the connection to the refugee definition arises that I'm not going to consider that today. I don't see those as issues. Thank you. So at the moment, I'm going to start to ask you some questions. I would like you to try to answer the questions in a straightforward way. If you yes, don't sir. understand a question, please ask, and I'll either repeat it or reword it or rephrase it, whatever it takes to try and help you understand it. It's very important that you do not guess or speculate unless I ask you to do so, okay? Yes, sir. Uh, we will be taking a break as the chairperson indicated, uh, but I'm wondering, do you have any questions for me right now? Um, no, not right now. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, sir, so I'm going to turn to your narrative All right. and ask you, ask you some questions to have you further explain to me to help me understand uh, the basis of your claim. You. Um, some of my questions may not relate directly to the narrative, but sort of arise from the narrative. Okay, so would you begin by telling me what family do you have left in Uganda? Um, I I have I have four siblings left. I have um, Hunter, Kelsey, James. Oh, and my parents. They're both business people. Okay, thank you. And your parents are well. Ah. Uh, yeah, they're all right. Okay. And where do they live? Um, they are living in, um, oh, I, I forget the town that they moved to. Sorry. Okay. Are you in regular touch with them by any means? Um, no, I just, just, just the family, the, 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 the my brothers and sisters. Okay. So you are in touch with your brothers and sisters? Yes. And how, how do you do that? Um, I, well, because of, because of my political platform, I have people who are able to um, make connections between me and them. Um, uh, can you be more specific, please? Um, well, let me ask you do, you, do you talk to them on the telephone? Um, I, we, we spoke, we, we spoke on the phone once or twice, but I try to, I try not to speak too much over the phone. And why is that? Just because of the fear, the, the fear of the persecution that I'm dealing with out here. Okay. Uh, do you communicate with them by, uh, with your computer? Um, rarely. But you do sometimes? But we do. It's, it's whenever, whenever we get the chances to make these connections, we do. Okay. It's just I, I have to be very careful. Okay. Have you spoken to them since the uh, last election? Um, I did speak with them, and um, they had told me that um, there was people around the home. They were around the perimeter. And why would that be? Well, because there's people that want to hurt me. Okay. If they want to hurt me due to, you know, my political presence. Sir, wh when did you leave Uganda? Pardon me? When did you leave Uganda? Um, I left Uganda in 2020. Can you be more specific? Um, it was the night, uh, January 30th, 2020. Um, I left Matanga, Masaka. Okay. That's the village where my family is from. Okay. And uh, so despite your having been away now for more than a year, uh, there, you're telling me that there's still people surrounding uh, your siblings' homes looking for you? They're, they're, still, they're still trying to find me. They need to find me. And I can't, I can't, I, I, I just can't do this. I, I have an account that's in my brother's name that I use for emergencies. That's kind of really what I have. Uh, could could your siblings not tell them that you've left the country? Um, that could that that would end up bringing persecution on them. Why do you say that? Well, because you know, when usually when somebody's out to get you, they'll go after family members that don't cooperate. Okay. Now, in your story, you mentioned um, that you were politically vocal while you were at university, and you were the university guild spokesperson. Yes. 
Can you explain to me what does a university guild spokesperson do? Um, well, uh, <laughs> we do a lot of things, but um, you see, how do I put this? We're, um, Sorry, I, 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 I can't, I can't, I can't come to that right now. Sorry. Okay, I, I find it strange that you would have a position with a title as grand as that and not recall what you did. It just, I just have a lot of things that are happening right now, you know. But um, I mean, well, let's see. Um, I did organize some peaceful inter-university demonstrations. Okay. Um, the, uh, oh, it, it, it was against taxation on mobile money transfer and internet services. Okay, I'll get to that in a moment. Um, but uh, it seems to me from reading your story uh, at this part of the uh, account, uh, many of your activities related to organizing activities and events is that correct right exactly i you know i was i was a dp student youth mobilizer okay and did you ever have speaking roles at rallies uh yes yes i actually did and there, there there's evidence of this as well what is the evidence um when was it oh i'm trying to remember Uh, well, I, I, there, there was a song, um, a, a under democratic song I used to sing. Many people knew of. Mm -hmm. Um, police are murderers. We shall never forget you. It was very popular at universities. You mentioned that in your narrative. Um, was it a song or a chant? Well, it was more of a chant. It was more of a chant, but you know we call chant songs. Uh, is it sort of like a soccer chant? Is that the kind of thing we're talking about? Yeah, kind of like a cheer, you know? Okay. Something that we all, you know, we kind of come together and say. But, um, I, so, sorry, continue. Okay. Um, I, I'm trying to move along here. And you, you indicated that uh, you were recruited to head uh, the student youth mobilization of the people power movement. Right. Who did that recruiting? Um, well, uh, let's see. I advised the people power movement, right? But um, I'm trying to remember. I believe it was, doo -doo 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 -doo. well, it, no, it was to depopularize President Museveni. Ah, who set it up? My apologies. I, I, I'm, I, I, just my mind isn't here right now. I'm so sorry. Sir, are you nervous today? I'm very nervous, sir. I'm, I'm very nervous. Okay, I, I can appreciate that. There's a lot at stake for you in a hearing such as this. Um, but I, I would encourage you maybe take a deep breath and, and try to help remember some of these things, which seem to be fairly central to your story. Yes, um, sir. Uh, I note, for example, that although you just told me that you had a, a significant speaking role at these rallies, you don't mention those uh, that speaking role in your narrative. Is there any reason why you left that out? Um, well, because uh, the last time that I had, you know, s spoke out, um, look at where I am now. So I left some of these things out. But in the narrative, you're required to outline the reasons why you fear returning to Uganda. Um, having spoken out and you're telling me now that that's a major thing, but it's not in the narrative. I, I'm concerned about that, uh, but I'll move along. Oh. Um, I'm hoping that you can breathe deeply and, and begin to relax a little bit more. Um, in paragraph eight of your narrative, you identify that you helped with the successful campaigns of two people who were elected as members of parliament, one in July of 2018 and one in August of 2018. Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah, I remember. <laughs> um, was that part of a general election? Um, it was, it was. Did you need the names of the people or 
we're okay no, there. No, no, I'm, I'm just uh, asking you that. That so, why were you helping these particular people? Um, I was helping them because I was head of the youth mobilizer. So you know, I fronted for the people of power, or well, the leader, Han Roberts. Um, we called him Bobby Wine. Okay. I, I ensured that our polling agents were available at all appalling stations on time and stayed until the counting of the votes. Okay. Um, so I'm just about ready to take a break, but uh, in paragraph nine, you refer to uh, some more activities that you did. And you say that these were a catalyst for your continued persecution. Uh, what persecution are you talking about? It's just it's it's just me speaking out at schools. Um, so for example, um, when I went for campaign for the recently elected um Han members of the parliament, um, the president's special forces killed one of our colleagues. We had stoned the president's convoy in disguise. Uh, you're getting you're getting ahead of yourself. I'm just asking. Sorry, before that time, what what persecution did you experience? Oh, the persecution that I experienced, um, it was just that the government authorities participated in messing up elections. And these were these were these are the catalysts that continued this. OK, so this was generalized persecution. It wasn't directed at you personally. Right, right. OK. All right. Thank you. I think this is probably a good time for us to take a short break. OK. OK, so I've. Um... I've had uh, Simon leave the room, so to speak, and I just want to um, encourage all of those who are watching along with us today, if you have any specific sort of thoughts or questions at this point, specifically related to this simulation, please do feel free to put them in the chat. Um, but I want us to uh, go to one of our poll questions. Um, let's see, yes, so first question, what are your impressions about the hearing process so far? So just based on what you've heard so far, is it not how I expected it would be, more complicated than I thought it would be, about what I expected, or more straightforward than I thought it would be? So I just wanna encourage everyone to, uh, to jump in with a comment. Um, is it what you thought or a little bit different? Okay. All right. So, so far, the results are um, a lot of people say, yeah, this is about what I expected. Um, but a few of us are saying, wow, this is not what I expected. It's more complicated. Uh, one person thinks it's a little more straightforward. So uh, thank you so much, everyone, for, uh, for chiming in. We have one more poll question um, to, for you to participate in. Um, great. So if you were the claimant, how might you be feeling right now? By the way, Simon is doing a great job acting. Um, if you were Simon right now, how might you be feeling? Anxious, confident, calm, worried, hopeful, defensive? What do you think? There are no wrong answers. It's just interesting to think about. Okay, so we're sort of all over the board, but a lot of us are agreeing. Um, I think the, the wide majority of us are saying, yeah, definitely anxious. Maybe a combination of a few things, but anxious and worried are nearing, nearing the top of the list. So thanks everyone for chiming in. Um, Tom, any reflections that you would wanna share with everyone so far? Um, I, I, well, I would observe that it's very difficult to assume someone else's identity. Um, uh, I've, I've skipped over some things which in a real hearing, uh, I would probe much more deeply than I did, uh, just because we're on a timeline today. Um, those, uh, those issues are potentially determinant of, of the decision and to uh, make a decision one has to be able to defend and justify the decision and the way to get at that is to explore more deeply what the facts are um, or appear to be based on the evidence before me um, i don't envy simon's role <laughs> yeah definitely 
definitely. Um, how long, oh, we have our first question. Thank you, Nikki. How long do these types of hearings usually last? Let's start with um, in real life. Um, I would think this hearing would probably last somewhere around three hours, two to three hours. Um, some, some hearings go a lot longer because they can be a very much more complicated. This claim is relatively straightforward. Um, you know, he's alleging that he was a political activist and that he's being, per he's being persecuted. Um, at some point uh, during a hearing, normally a member would uh, develop a feeling uh, or a decision, sort of potentially a decision, a tentative decision, shall I call it, based on, on the evidence that they've heard up to that point. Uh, I have had the experience of feeling very positive about a claim that I'm hearing and then having a claimant give me some completely, uh, completely unsatisfactory evidence just near the hearing, uh, the end of the hearing, sorry. And <laughs> that's devastating. It, it's like a kick in the gut because it means you've got to reconsider or probe a whole lot further to uh, understand why uh, the claimant provided such contradictory evidence or whatever in some places. Right, absolutely. There's a great question from Haley. Is it more common for claimants to be uncertain of their answers during the hearing? And if so, does that have a large impact on your ability to render a decision? Uh, no, it's not, a, it's not common for a claimant to be uncertain of their answers, um, unless you start probing so deeply uh, that they get into an area where they're not comfortable or aren't familiar with the facts. Um, but usually at, at first go, the claimants are pretty, uh, pretty capable at providing straightforward answers. The next question is, are many clients accompanied by a lawyer? Can they uh, just be represented? Well, most claimants are accompanied by a lawyer. Um, the lawyer uh, has a turn after uh, the member finishes asking questions and gets to the end of their questions and says specifically, I have no more questions. Then the lawyer has an opportunity to ask questions. And often when a claimant has provided weak testimony or inconsistent testimony in an area, the lawyer may, they, they have to exercise their own judgment, they may go back and ask more questions trying to solve or clear up the problem. I've seen situations where they just make it worse, <laughs> um, but that's, you know, that's the lawyer's judgment. And, and then at the end of that, uh, the, the uh, lawyer is invited to make submissions, usually lasting uh, anywhere from two to 10 minutes uh, on why uh, the member should find the claimant to be a convention refugee or a person in need of protection. So that brings us to Julia's question, which is, is basically what are the potential outcomes of a hearing? Um, you just mentioned two possibilities, but there's also the chance that someone would get denied, right? Oh, of course, yes. Um, the outcomes are that the claim will be accepted and you can give a, a, an oral decision from the bench or from the front of the, the, the room when you're actually sitting in a room together. Uh, the claim can be uh, denied or turned down and you can do that orally as well. It's very challenging to do that. Um, it's not a very comfortable feeling to tell someone uh, right in the room that you don't believe their story and you have to give reasons for not believing their story. Um, or you can reserve your judgment and you can go uh, away and think about all the evidence that you have before you and make a determination and then give your decision. Uh, when you reserve your judgment uh, and make a decision, normally it requires a written uh, uh, set of reasons to justify the decision. Does that answer the question? I think so. Um, and we can talk about it more afterwards as well. Uh, there's one more sort of general question uh, that I wanna touch on before we jump back in. Um, sure. which is how do you typically assess the credibility of, a, of a, a refugee claimant if they can't remember certain details? And I think that's a really interesting question because we know trauma is complicated 
and many people are coming from deeply traumatic situations. If a client can't remember certain details or can't go into depth, does that definitely negatively affect their application or is there some discernment there? Well, there's always room for personal judgment. Um, that's why we have personal hearings and, and not just written, written claims. Um, it's a challenge. Um, <laughs> I used to say uh, that I wished I'd had the training and credibility uh, assessment uh, when I was a vice principal years and years ago <laughs> and dealing with young people who told me stories the same as claimants sometimes do. But basically you look for issues of inconsistency, um, serious omissions from a story, okay? Um, and uh, I'll say more about that afterwards if you like. Uh, serious omissions from a story that are now advanced here uh, in the hearing and weren't put down in writing previously. Um, vagueness, um, etc. Uh, on a topic that you would uh, feel vagueness is not appropriate, uh, allowing for nervousness and so on. Um, in general, I would say that as a rule of thumb, if a claimant provides significantly inconsistent or contradictory evidence on two or three significant areas of their claim, that's probably enough to have the claim be denied. Mm. Wow. Okay. okay, well, we'll hear more about this um, afterward, but uh, I think Simon is back in the room. And so um, I will leave you to it and ask you to continue your time together. Thank you. I can't see Simon yet. Can you see Simon now? No. Oh, hey. There we go. There we go. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I hope you got a drink of water in the break. <sighs> yes. Okay. So. We're back on the record now, and the proceedings are being recorded, of course. Um, you started to tell me about an, an incident that you mentioned in your narrative where, where you were involved in stoning the president's convoy. Okay. Yeah. Would you please tell me more about that? What was that all about? Oh, boy. Um, well, um, we went for campaigns that were elected uh, by the Han Member of Parliament representing the Aurora Municipality. And um, Kathil Wadri, on August 13, 2018, um, the President's Special Forces had killed one of our colleagues. So we had stoned the President's convoy in disguise, of course. I'm lucky that I was among those who managed to escape back to Kampala in a truck before being arrested. Okay. Uh, I want to, um, pardon? Sorry. Do you remember the date of that incident? Um, that, that date was August 13th. 2018. Okay. Um, and, you, and you say in, in the same sentence where you identify that date of August 13th, that he was recently elected. Okay. But in yeah. paragraph eight, you say uh, that there was an election and he was elected a member of parliament on the 15th of August. Can well, you explain the discrepancy to me, please? Um, I, I, maybe, I, maybe I did have the day mixed. Sorry, sir. Okay. Which would uh, be the which would be the correct date? I, um, I, I think the correct date is August thirteenth, twenty eighteen. Okay. And when you set off from home that day, was it your intention to stone the president's convoy? Oh goodness, no. What, then tell me how that came to be. It, it was it was like a reaction, you know. Um, uh, it was it was it was it was a rack, It was just a reaction between us, you know. They, they took out one of our guys, and we, we we reacted back. How many people were in this? Uh, uh, what can I call it? A disturbance. The oh um, there was I think five people. Oh, not very many. And what happened that one of your colleagues was killed? The, um, he was just, 
He was coming by. I think I think he was arrested. No, 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 no. Um, we were we we were speaking, and then um, just the opposition team they came out with guns, told us to told us that we need to stop talking and pulled triggers. And one person, one of our colleagues, went down. So I'm having trouble picturing this. So you were sitting talking with four of your colleagues, and the president's forces came along and shot one. Yes, it was. It was like they were they were, they were trying to you know get 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 control or something. I don't know, but that's what happened to us. And then so we ended up we 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 retaliated. That's the word I'm using. My apologies. Did you know the president's convoy was going to be coming along that route? Um. Not no, not really. So this thing was sort of a spontaneous uh, event. Well. It was, but there was a time I'm, I was charged for, for a supposed unlawful assembly. Now, when was that? Um, December 4th. Of what year? December 4th, uh, 2019. It was 2019, sir. Okay, but we were talking about the incident on August the 13th of 2018. Oh, sorry. I, th I, 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 I thought we moved from that. My apologies. No, um, I'm still trying to understand what happened that day. Uh, okay. So, um, well, I was receiving, I was receiving some um, concealed calls, phone calls. Um, they were making inquiries about my family. Um, some Bora Bora guys, they were following me. You know, we had to change cars. So you received those calls before August the 13th? Um, we actually received it just after we stoned the convoy. Okay, so I remember before the break, I asked you what persecution you had experienced, and you acknowledged that it was simply generalized uh, sort of harassment from the government for opposing them. Um, right, but now you're telling me that you were involved in an incident of stoning the president, and um, then you said, okay, then now they started getting after you, making inquiries and following you and so on. Is that the right sequence of events? Um, yes, sir. Okay. So you escaped on August the 13th. Um, no. Pardon? pardon? You escaped on August the 13th? No, I, I, no, when, you mean when I escaped back to, when I escaped from Uganda? No, sir. Oh, from, yes, yes, yes. From sorry. the storming of the president's convoy. Yes, yes, I escaped from that. Okay. And the next incident that you described uh, is that you were picked up uh, at your home in December of 2019. Yes. Okay. So that's 15 and a half months later. Okay. What happened in between? Um... Well, um, in between, yeah. um, there was an order given to arrest all of the people that were seen campaigning for Han Casino. And many of my colleagues have since been arrested or kidnapped or locked up in undisclosed places. Okay. And what happened to you? Anything? Um, well, for me personally, um, well, not until December 4th. And why do you think they came after you on December the 4th? Um, because, well, because they had insufficient evidence to charge me. Sir, that doesn't make sense. Uh, you're saying they came after you because they had insufficient evidence? Well, yeah, because I was charged with fabricated crimes of holding unlawful assembly, and when the police and when the police, or, or sorry, when the release on the police bond on December fourth, twenty nineteen, oh, that's because of the insufficient evidence that they tried to charge me with. 
Okay, you've jumped to December the 4th. I was, I was still on the point where they picked you up at your home at the gate. Um, I'm asking you why they would do that when the incident involving uh, your colleague was 15 and a half months earlier. Um, just, I, I, I don't, I, I can't recall that time. I just, I, I don't know right in there. Sorry. Okay. Okay. So you were picked up on the December the 1st. Tell me what happened to you. Okay. So on, on December 1st, um, 2019 on my way home, I was picked up from my car at a rented home. Um, I, I was in, um, Mbaya. At okay. the gate and locked up in a place it's unknown to me okay um i spent mm -hmm. three days there and was later taken to kira road the police station now during the detention in an unknown place i was severely beaten my right arm was twisted into very uncomfortable positions to a point of me thinking it would break apart from water only one meal was provided during these three nights okay is that the worst that happened to you? They twisted your arm? I was severely beaten. Oh, okay. Did you go to a hospital when you were eventually released? Um, yes. And uh, did you provide the immigration board with a copy of your uh, hospital report? Um, well, I was, oh. I was told that the police didn't have enough evidence. Okay, but you testified in your narrative, you said you went to the May Medical Center. Yes, yes, correct? yes, yes. Okay. Did you get yes. a, a, a discharge from there or when a, a report of your injuries? Um, well, yes, but the thing is, is um, yes, yes, I did. Okay, so why haven't you given it to the board? Um, because I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for my, I'm waiting to get into contact with one of my siblings to get it to me. Because um, there, they, there was a tip about me being in there. Okay, I'm going, I'm going to jump ahead again. Um, so you, uh, you, you say you were tipped off about a plot to kill you. What, what had you done during this time to raise your profile so that someone from the government would want to kill you? Well, um, I have an account in my brother's name that I use for emergency with you know, over 20 million UTX. It's available to me and my brother to pay to get me the visa and arrange my escape out of the country. No, sir, listen to my question. Sorry. <coughs> my question is, excuse me. <coughs> My question is, you said you were tipped off about uh, the fact that the government wanted to kill you. Yes. Uh, so I'm w wondering, what did you do that was sufficiently serious to make the government oh. want to kill you? Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, um, I, I had made a raid. I'm sorry. Whoa, my bad. Um, I've been slowly shifting items for a month from my home um, to prepare for my escape. I made arrangements to ensure that I could run away to Canada, but due to liquidity challenges at the time, I could not make proper arrangements for my family. Okay, but I'm, I'm, I'm only going to ask one more time. Um, why would the government decide that they needed to kill you? I, I, I but just, you know, just basic movement, just what I'm doing with my life. I'm sorry. I, I, I don't know what to answer that for you. Okay. So where did you go to get your uh, visa? Pardon? Where did you go when you decided to leave the country? Where did you go to get your visa to Canada? Um, I, I, I got, I got my brother. To, to get the visa for me. So you didn't have to appear in person? Nope. And do you know where they went to get it? Um, no, my brother didn't share that information with me. Did they leave the country to the best of your knowledge? Um, well, my, my brother, yes. Okay. And do you know where he went to get it? No. 
And why did you decide to come to Canada? Um, well, because I have a clear and present danger of persecution if I return to Uganda. So I seek protection in Canada. Why Canada, I'm asking. Pardon? Why Canada? Well, because Canada is, Canada is, um, Canada is a safe, you know, loving place, great people. And I, I really believe that I can, I, I can make some changes out here. Okay, thank you, sir, for your testimony. I have no more questions right now. Thank you, sir. Okay. Whew. Okay, Simon, Andre, thank you. Mike, Dad, I, I, yeah, <laughs> I'm feeling it with you. <laughs> I mean, even just even just pretending, right? To I know, but like, this. oh, I'm sweating. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm there with you. My I feel my heart rate up too, just like the pressure of it. Um, I felt Simon, I felt like I was beating you up. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, oh, that man. was amazing. That was so fun. <laughs> <laughs> Andre, thank you for stepping into this role. We really appreciate it. And um, I may ask you a few more questions in just a moment. Um, okay. yeah, yeah, thank I'm you. Here. Um, so just a couple of questions before we wrap up the recording um, is this was a simulation. And so when you do simulations, is there sort of, are you taking on kind of a responsibility to, to make it tough for people? Um, can you talk a little bit about that and that role? Um, how, how no, I, I don't deliberately try to make it tough. Um, I try to make it realistic. Um, the, the difficulty in this simulation, of course, is that it was a, a, a demonstration of a simulation that was not a real life lived. And so some of the questions, which were pretty basic, were very difficult for Simon um, because he had no way of knowing what I was going to ask. And I can ask whatever comes to mind. So it's really difficult for someone in that situation. Um, Normally, a claimant would have some other answers, I think, in, in some situations. But no, I, to go back to your basic question, I, but there's no way that you set out to make it um, deliberately uh, difficult. And I can, I can mention to you, and our viewers might be interested to know, that the members of the board are organized in teams so that, for example, at one point, I was the coordinating member for all the members who uh, dealt with claims from Africa. Right. And so we met from time to time to discuss the circumstances in countries such as Uganda. And, for example, with this campaign, there might have been a, a discussion about if there was a lot of claims like this, there would be a discussion about what is the real circumstance in Uganda, what's happening, because one of these challenges that the board faces in making decisions is to be consistent. Okay. The theory is that no matter who, what member the claimant appears before, they should get the same decision, right? Uh, that's uh, that's a, a big issue. And um, the board goes to great uh, lengths to try to ensure that happens, but it's an ongoing challenge. Yeah, certainly. Um... I will we'll sort of wrap up. I, I think the big question is, given Simon's story, thank you, Diane, for throwing that in. Uh, and of course, knowing that this is a simulation and so there were things about it that weren't quite true to life, but would you be likely to approve Simon's application in this case? Well, in, in, even in a simulation, as you know, we don't give legal advice and we don't give a decision. Um, I'm going to stretch the boundaries and say, I think it's pretty obvious, or maybe it's not, but to me, it's pretty obvious. This is not a positive claim. <laughs> um, there were many difficulties with Simon's testimony if they were to occur in real life. Um, and so I, wouldn't, I would probably find the claimant not to be credible. Mm -hmm. And what, if, Naomi, if you just let me add one thing that I really Please. think should be understood by observers. I am not speaking for the IRB. I am no longer a member of the IRB. I have not been a member of the IRB for several years now. And so although I have extensive experience from the IRB, please don't assume that anything I say or do is anything other than my personal experience and my personal viewpoints. 
Thank you for that. And thank you for taking the time today. Um, I, we will come back to some questions as soon as we finish the recording. But before we do, I just want to check in um, with Scott. Scott, is there anything you want to add briefly about just, um, you know, the program and anything you feel people should understand about the work and, and also where they could go if they do have questions? Sure. Thanks, Naomi. Yeah. Well, when we do a simulation, um, that is to say, when a refugee claimant <clears throat> signs up to the refugee hearing program, the, the program that we offer and the kind of and, and Tom would prepare similar questions for for any person uh, in, in a similar fashion. Um, we do send them some material ahead of time. And so we tell them sort of how to set up their, 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 their background, their video, um, because there are no in-person hearings with the Immigration Refugee Board right now. So they're all being done by video. So we try to give them some tips around that, but we also give them some general uh, information like, you know what, um, you are uh, at, at a minimum, at a minimum, you are responsible for knowing your, your story. And so you need to study this as though it was like, a, a, you know, a very, very important, you know, a exam for, you know, law school or something like, um, at, at a minimum, you should know your, your narrative material. Now, the member, the, the role Tom was playing today, you know, he's going to drill down and in any area he, he feels like. And, um, you know, that's where, you know, you start to look for any, if there's going to be any inconsistencies, but we try to prepare people even for the simulation. And then the hope is that at the conclusion of the simulation, we do give feedback uh, again, not legal advice, but we do give feedback on how the participant presented themselves. And so hopefully they're going into their real hearing with the Immigration and Refugee Board, much more emotionally and mentally prepared for the kind of environment and the kind of questions. And a lot of times you get people, it's, it's a real eye opener, you know, those light bulbs go on and they're like, oh, I, you know, I had no idea that that, you know, was going to be something would be called into question or uh, uh, that sort of thing. Um, or they, they mess up dates and we'll say, look, just know your dates because that'll, that'll just lend to credibility. Yeah, I have to say that's one of the moments where I felt the most empathy for Simon was just, I'm terrible with dates. If you ask me what date something happened, I, I mean, but yeah, this is the kind of preparation that you're offering. And so thank you for the work that you're doing. Uh, a reminder that people can- I just interject that yes. Simon's yeah. answer in that area was actually quite good. All right. <laughs> he, he, it was, the, the narrative is, is inconsistent and he just said that's, a, basically said that's a mistake. And that's, that's acceptable if mistakes happen. Okay, yeah. you would not reject a claim based on that. Mm. Okay. I'm, I'm learning so much today. I'm really grateful for everyone who's here. Um, and so I just wanna say thank you to anyone who's tuning into the recording. Thank you for spending some time with us and please do visit micahouse.ca to learn more about this organization as a whole or to find a way to, um, to check in and ask questions. Um, the contact form is there, the newsletter sign up is there and you can uh, reach out and connect with Scott through that as well. So again, thank you so much for joining us. Um, have a great day.